The world of Night City is filled to the brim with secrets and hidden conversations waiting for the player to discover. In this video, we're going to explore nine shocking secrets and tiny details you probably missed in Cyberpunk 2077 and the Phantom Liberty expansion. So buckle up, grab some iced coffee, and let's venture into the dark future. Number one, new details about Mr. Blue Eyes. One of the biggest sources of mystery and fan theories in the cyberpunk universe is this shady blue-eyed man. We can spot him at the end of the Dream On quest, where we learn the prospective mayor is being mind-controlled by some unknown group, and later on during the Path of Glory ending, where Mr. Blue Eyes hires us for a high-risk mission at the Crystal Palace Orbital Casino. In the Phantom Liberty expansion, we can spot Mr. Blue Eyes once again during the Killing Moon mission. If we side with Songbird at the stadium, she will arrange transport with an unknown patron to obtain medical care at a space station of all places. If we press Songbird for info on her contact, she has this to say. One thing, thing you forgot to tell me. Who got you this flight? Funny thing is, I don't know. Proxy showed up. A corpo every man for the ages. Expensive, understated suit, dark hair, blue eyes. He asked me questions. The kind only I know the answers to. Blackwell, that the issue? Mm, and other things. Rather not talk about it. Just don't judge me, okay? The description is unmistakable and can be none other than Mr. Blue Eyes. And if there's any doubt in your mind about this connection, what if I told you we can actually spot Mr. Blue Eyes at several points during the mission? As V and Songbird are making their way through the airport, you can see Mr. Blue Eyes overlooking the area from a multi-story office building. And later, when you finally defeat all the NUSA soldiers and get onto the tram, you can spot Mr. Blue Eyes again, this time sporting a black umbrella. Shout out to the YouTuber Little Danny B for posting this detail. I swear this isn't an alt account, by the way. Big Dan recognized Little Dan, brother. While we still do not know 100% who Mr. Blue Eyes is, his interest in Stongbird is likely due to her connection with the Black Wall. And his access to an orbital research station lines up with our experience in the Path of Glory ending, where Mr. Blue Eyes sends us to an orbital station so we can launch a heist at the Crystal Palace Casino. Looking to level up your career in the new year? Then today's sponsor may be just the thing you need to step into a high paying job. Boot.dev is the best platform for learning backend web development. The good folks at Boot.dev believe the smartest way to learn to code is to conquer boredom. So they've taken an approach of game design to help make their backend development lessons fun and rewarding. As you complete coding assignments, you will earn XP, achievements, and complete quests on your journey to become a max level backend developer. But these ain't no simple Simple fetch quests like some games out there. With Boot.dev, you'll be diving right into the writing process because the best way to learn software development is to start coding and shipping projects. So you'll be writing tons of code in Python and Go, and if you ever feel stuck, you're not alone because there is an incredibly active Discord community for Boot.dev where you can ask questions and talk with other students. In today's technology-driven economy, programmers have amazing earning potential. In fact, the median salary in the US for back-end developers last year was over $100,000. Plus, programmers often have the flexibility to work from home. So if you're looking to make a career change or just learn a new set of skills, then now is a great time to get started with Boot.dev. It's free to create an account and demo the courses. Click the link in the description and use my code to get 25% off your first payment for Boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or your first year, depending on the subscription you choose. Big shout out to Boot.dev for sponsoring this video. Number two, what happens if you fail to save the president in Cyberpunk Phantom Liberty? At the beginning of the expansion, the Bargess gang manages to shoot the NUSA president's aircraft down with a missile. In the aftermath, V makes a mad dash to the crash site, fighting through robots and Bargess goons in a bid to save Rosalind Myers. However, if you run away from the scene instead of booking it to the crash site, then you'll trigger a critical mission failure for the entire main plot of Phantom Liberty. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Get to the crash site, now! Congrats, V. You just killed Rosalind Myers and f the NUSA. What the hell are you spewing, Songbird? You had one job. Get to the plane, save her. You failed. You killed her, as if you pulled the trigger yourself. Pray we don't meet again, and I mean ever. Uh, uh huh. 
Still with us? Oh, what the... What happened? Your presidential rescue op. Miserable failure. Honestly, though, good f***ing riddance. <sighs> okay. So now what? Huh. We go on living. Start by finding us a drink. Sorry, Songbird. This whole business just seemed too shady to risk my life for. Now, after failing the mission, I tried to visit the crash site, but the path that you used to enter the site was walled off with a closed door, seemingly inaccessible without using glitches or console commands. Interestingly, you can still complete missions for Mr. Hands and presumably other side content in the DLC, but the whole main quest line is failed when we abandon Cyberpunk Air Force One. Number three, new details about Sandra Dorset. The target of our first rescue mission in Act One has an interesting backstory in why she was targeted by Scavers. I have a full video exploring the reasons why Sandra Dorset was attacked if you want to dive deep, but the TLDR version is that she was snooping into Night Corp and discovered they were mind controlling their own employees in a shady research project. Night Corp discovered that Sandra Dorset had unearthed their dirty laundry and arranged for a group of scavers to kidnap and kill her. But Jackie and V arrived just in time to save the day. This explains why Sandra was targeted, but we still don't know exactly how. Interestingly, new details have emerged in the Phantom Liberty expansion, which sheds some more light on the scavers' method of attack. During the gig, The Man Who Killed Jason Foreman, you can find a laptop with messages detailing the methods used to hack Sandra Dorset's biomonitor, which prevented Trauma Team from tracking her location. Basically, they would create an infected shard which would jam the signal on the target's biomonitor, preventing it from communicating with Trauma Team and essentially masking the victim's location. This lines up with what we see in the rescue, because the moment V removed the infected shard, the biomonitor signal triggers a response from Trauma Team, who arrives promptly. Subsequent messages mention Sandra by name. I got that new Zeta Tech biomonitor with the soft update, and something not right. Keeps generating hashes using SHA-8192, and no f***ing matches. The brute force that crashed Sandra Dorset's hardware isn't doing shit either. Help a choom out here. One more interesting detail about Sandra involves a peculiar consumable item that you can discover in Night City. In the United States, it was commonplace at one point in time to publish images of missing people on milk cartons. And this practice must have continued into the dark future because sure enough, you can discover a milk carton with Sandra Dorset's image plastered on it in Cyberpunk 2077. You might want to check the expiration date before drinking that though because that chick is already rescued by the time you would find one of these. Number four, finding Meredith Stout's body. One major path we can decide to walk is to betray Meredith Stout during the pickup. And if we do this, things won't end well for the high-strung corpo lady, as hinted by Anthony Gilchrist in a brief chat at the end of the mission. Gilchrist meant this quite literally, and the price for failure in the corporate world is steep. If we head to this location in Watson later in Act 2, we can discover Meredith sleeping with the fishes and have a brief chat with Johnny. <laughs> Militech don't forgive. Militech don't forget. Acquaintance of yours? Yep. Familiar face from my past life. Number five, Origins of Bar Guest. Bar Guest is the biggest, baddest militarized gang in all of Night City, with complete control over the sector of Dogtown, which technically falls outside of the jurisdiction of Night City, but hey, we're splitting hairs here. The name of this gang is actually a reference to CD Projekt Red's first game, The Witcher, released in 2007. The word Barghast originates from English folklore, which depicted the creature as a vicious large black dog with sharp fangs. And in The Witcher 1, the first major boss fight in the game is the Barghast, a creature that lines up well with the same folklore descriptions. And let me tell you, this fight is a gigantic pain in the ass, quite literally for Geralt. The bar guest has the ability to inflict a pain debuff on Geralt with its agonizing howl, which stunlocks the Witcher, leaving him free to take damage from the bar guest and its never-ending pack of dogs. And the boss literally just spams that howl throughout the entire fight. 
You may have some assistance in the fight, either from Abigail or the townspeople, depending on your choices, but they usually go down like a sack of bricks within seconds, so you're pretty much on your own. The Witcher is a beautiful, janky mess of a game that I absolutely love, but this fight is definitely one of the lowlights from the game. You can check out my review of the first Witcher if you're interested in checking it out for yourself, but it's cool to see CDPR acknowledging their roots with this Easter egg. Number 6, Blackwall Cyberdeck Yappin. If you decide to go against Songbird during Phantom Liberty's main story, you'll have the opportunity to obtain a really powerful cyberdeck with capabilities of reaching beyond the Blackwall. And this cyberdeck has a lot to say, frequently yapping at V during combat encounters and even some quest moments. This voice is either a rogue AI or perhaps the Blackwall itself. The most interesting dialogue I discovered happens during the quest shot by both sides, where V helps a journalist infiltrate a defunct Militech research facility. As you view the video logs of the researchers, the Kanto cyberdeck will have some interesting things to say about Militech's probing into the Black Wall. There's some newer footage, dated 2068. Must be when they came back. Come here, take a look. You seek the key to a door that does not exist. Typical of your kind. Number 7, Bree's True Intentions. Speaking of the side quests shot by both sides, V will be faced with a decision between saving the journalist or letting the Militech hitman take her out at the end of the mission. At face value, it would seem that Militech is trying to cover up a potential scandal by any means necessary, even killing an independent journalist to keep their dirty secrets under wraps. But there is more to this story than meets the eye. Bree is not merely here as a scrappy investigative journalist trying to expose corporal corruption. Her intentions are much more self-serving than she would have you believe, which is something Dante tells us directly. And it turns out, he wasn't capping. Because if we side with Bree, she'll end up selling off all the data to a publication before dipping out. And for our efforts in the deal, we'll end up getting targeted by a Netwatch agent in the fallout. Briefly, V. Netwatch has dispatched a... Hunter, as the quarry, exercise caution. Say what? Bree Whitney sold the Militech's data, then disappeared. Netwatch is now out to wipe anyone who came close to it. Occupational hazard. Take care of yourself, V. Chick hazed me. If we kill Bree instead and read her data shard, we'll see that she was mainly in this for the paycheck and didn't care one bit about any harm she would cause to V or any Militech employees. This doesn't mean that Dante or Militech are in the right, which is probably why this quest is called Shot by Both Sides, since V basically gets screwed either way. One other interesting detail from this encounter is that you can actually spot Bree right at the beginning of the DLC as you meet up with Songbird for the first time. She is waiting outside the gates in the queue, waiting to get into Dogtown. Number 8. Gang Reputation in Phantom Liberty The decisions you make in the base game can actually have an impact in the DLC, and vice versa. A few interesting examples of this are how different gangs will react to V depending on choices you make during main story missions. During the quest where V and Reed pay a visit to the Netrunner Slider, you'll have to parlay with the Voodoo Boys to gain access to the big man. If you killed Brigitte and the high-ranking VDB members during the main quest, you can actually shit-talk and provoke these Voodoo Boys in Dogtown. Not about to be stopped by the likes of you. Gonna get Slider, just like I got my mom Brigitte. That was you. Everybody just keep calm. Off, grumpy. How bad, Chum? Come on, V. Let's be on our way. Bad call, mother Let's go! We also have the opportunity to flex our stuff to the animals during the side quest No Easy Way Out. But this time we can broker a peaceful resolution to the quest and preserve Eren's fight integrity by referencing our boss fight with Sasquatch in the GIM. One other way to resolve this, Eren will take his sweet time coming too. Unless you want to end up like Sasquatch. Didn't think he could afford a merc in your league. I was wrong. Swung above his weight. But... I advise you to consider what you're going to tell him when he wakes up. 
There are other ways to finish this quest without violence, but it's cool to see an opportunity to flex on this broad after moving through the main story in Pacifica. Number 9. High Street Cred Wakako During our quest to track down Evelyn Parker, we need to obtain an illegal brain dance from a sketchy BD dealer who looks like he walked off the set of Boogie Nights. Judy and V will then analyze the clues in the brain dance to pinpoint the location of the scavers who are holding Evelyn captive. However, there is another person who knows where this XBD outfit operates, our fixer friend Wakako. The only problem is she will not spill the beans to us to protect her client fixer confidentiality, trade secrets and all that. But if you manage to gain at least 45 street cred before completing this mission, then you can actually bypass the whole brain dance section of the quest and convince Wakako to give you the information directly. Looking for a brain dance. Oh, any particular one? Logo on the casing, a death's head moth. Whoa, now, that's quicksand. So I would advise caution. Can you get me one of those recordings? Listen, I've seen what you can do. You've earned my respect, and I want you earning more of my eddies. So here's what's going to happen. I'll get you what you want. Just look out for a package. Thanks, Wako. Where'll the pickup be? I'll have my guy drop it off in a secure location. Sending you the coordinates now. My client wants something. You need to get it for me. You'll get a quest marker to find the XBD in a nearby dead drop, and then proceed with the quest normally from here. So there you have it. Nine shocking secrets and tiny details you probably missed in Cyberpunk 2077. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to Big Dan Gaming for more Cyberpunk and RPG videos. Big shout out to all the channel members for supporting my content. Until next time, this has been Big Dan. I should go.